first of all, I appreciate being invited to speak here. I've been waiting 10 years at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you only asked of, us for, for one year and you came. I know, so I called. <laughs> yeah. Don't blame us. <laughs> so I called Trevor. So I have a, uh, this, this should be very interesting for those of you who are, as you said, interested in psychiatry, um, especially. So this may be a life-changing lecture. Um, I titled it, as I wrote this lecture yesterday, uh, Methods Taught for the Diagnosis and Treatment of Chemical Sensitivity and Many Chronic Illnesses by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. And I put the name of the academy that I'm a member of, just so you remember that there is a group of physicians who does this for a living. Uh, there may be a thousand people in the group. You're welcome to attend the meeting in the future or go study with a physician around the country. Um, this is controversial, which is always exciting, and it's very personal to me. Um, let's see. So as I mentioned, it may change your outlook on medicine. Once you know this, there's no going back, just so you know. So even by hearing a one-hour lecture or 40, am I 40 minutes? Does anybody know? 45 how? minutes or 15 minutes to questions. Okay. It may change your outlook so much that you can't practice exactly the way you thought you were going to. Um, I never would have anticipated that I would be standing here giving a talk about this subject. At Cornell, they taught me to believe the patient. They had a patient who used to walk through doorways and go Ugh, like this. And they all thought she was crazy and she had a thalamic tumor. And for some reason, her interpretation of the doorway and spatial relations or whatever caused her to have a, a, like a hemibolism or a dystonic reaction or whatever. And instead of labeling her nuts, they found out the source of the lesion. So even though Cornell is, I guess, relatively conservative, I believed the patient when I was an emergency medicine practitioner. And I feel I would like to be believed now. So before we get going, I went to Penn and Cornell. I did general surgery, then emergency medicine residency. I practiced emergency medicine in Los Angeles in a very nice situation. I rode horses and had a nice house and everything was going well. And then I became too weak to work. I couldn't intubate. The nurse would have to pull up on the laryngoscope for me because my arm was too weak. Um, I didn't have Lyme disease. This was also presented at a Lyme talk, so occasionally you see the word Lyme in here. Um, I had no idea what was wrong with me. What I learned has changed my life and my viewpoint for the potential to get to the cause of many diseases. It's not just about chemical sensitivity and the, my bizarre situation. This situation occurs in many of us as we get older, and you're going to find relatives and friends who have this. I started a nonprofit that focuses on education about environmental, integrative, and preventive medicine. I've been named to the CDC's National Conversation on Chemicals and Public Health, as well as a roundtable on building and health at NIH. In both organizations, we focus specifically on mold-induced illness and the need for more government-funded research in this area and the chemical intolerance that follows from mold exposure. And I don't have any financial interest in anything. In fact, I just started working, so that's my one financial interest is that patients can now come to me but I've been disabled for 10 years. So some of these lines are just my classic way of explaining this. We're all in a continuum from one to 10 of being affected by the environment. No one's a zero. So people wanna say they don't have my condition and it's really, everybody's got a little something. No one really is perfect. How you deal with your exposures is what makes you less or more environmentally ill. It's very common, look for it in every patient. So I think one of the important slides I almost left out was that environmental medicine is a misnomer. It's not just about exposures. Environmental medicine started out with food allergy, food intolerance. And does anybody know about this? Is everybody familiar with these concepts or not really? Okay. So I'll go through the players and the doctors who discovered this, but it started all with food intolerance and women's reaction, largely women, but people's reaction to foods that they were sensitive to. And then eventually it progressed to foods with pesticides and how they responded to the foods with pesticides but not to organic. And the concept of eating organic came out of environmental medicine. So it also deals with nutritional, hormonal, infectious, genetic, EMF, altitude changes, infectious and toxic exposures. People hear the word environmental and they get turned off. <clears throat> it's completely different 
from the study of emergencies induced by acute exposure to toxins, because we all acknowledge acute poisonings. It's the chronic response to toxic exposure that's been debated for the last seven decades and that we focus on today. And my memory is not so top, so I have to put a slide that reminds me what I want to talk about. So I'm sorry if it's boring, but later, if somebody has the PowerPoint, they can get the whole gist without having a video. Um, you know, I thought this was funny. Do you know who said this? Right. And ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So I thought it was really queer, but then I thought, oh, it's Ben Franklin. I got to put it in. <laughs> so that's the gist. It really is important. People don't really want to prevent disease. They, they usually come for help when they're suffering and they're in pain. So a lot of doctors become passionate after recovering from something awful, and then they're on a crusade to talk about it. So I guess that's my, my situation. I'm upset that I almost died from a condition that no one acknowledges is real. I want to prevent others from the horrific experience that I had. I would like, these are my desires, in case you can uh, do it for me. I'd like med school education to incorporate taking an environmental history and help put cause and effect together in a temporal fashion. When were you last well? What happened to you before that time? Did you move into an office and there were exhaust fumes coming from the floor and it made everybody sick? Even though not everybody will have the same symptom. Some people will have fatigue, some people will have joint pain, some people will have nausea. And the question is, can you identify the unifying exposure? I would like AMA policy to change on the existence of these conditions and the utility of environmental medicine. Their policy is 20 years old it says that chronic fatigue syndrome and Gulf War syndrome, they're not real, and that environmental medicine techniques and their allergy testing method are bogus. So I've been working towards that, and I, was, I had a vote in the Mass Medical Society, I, where I'm a delegate, and I wrote a resolution to take this to the AMA, and I lost by 10 votes out of 400. And it was because the previous president, who was a male, went against me, and people couldn't decide if he was right or I was right. You have to look at the interests of people. If they're on a committee or they're an Ahmed physician, and for decades they've been saying that, let's say, chemical sensitivity is not a real condition, they're not going to reverse their position just one day out of the blue because they've published in this area. Their, their, their um, reputation is at stake. So it's very hard to get people to switch so we know that it's the young people that come along that haven't had a vested interest in their careers already that can change policy. I'd like to see a fellowship and integrated in environmental medicine which could follow when you do PEDS, internal medicine, family practice, or ER, or anything. You could do a year of fellowship and then really have your hand, hands on how to practice as an environmental physician, or just go back and do FP and take the knowledge and, and integrate it a little bit. And I'd like to see a system that teaches doctors to recognize and refer patients who need an environmental physician and less to a psychiatrist except in a psychiatric emergency when you need to stabilize with medications, while more thorough treatment can start. So the idea is, yeah, you can slog somebody for the night, but then in the morning you've got to wake up and start figuring out why they were so crazy the night before. We should reach in towards the crazy patient with all sorts of weird complaints and say, I know what you have. What you should do is lean in and take care of them, not run away from them in fear, making ourselves feel better when we label them nuts because we're copping out, which is really what's happening to, to most specialists, neurologists, um, rheumatologists. If the person comes in and has lots of complaints, starts crying, speaks very quickly, the doctor says, oh my god, they need a psychiatrist. Boom, they're done. Even if they have a rheumatologic disorder or a neurologic problem, they don't even want to handle it. Quickly, these are some of the articles that have been written about me. In the Penn Gazette, I took two years of uh, bothering them and asking them to write an article about what happened to me. So this is it. It's called A Product of Her Environment. And I was successfully treated by a doctor named Bill Ray, whose name is down here. <clears throat> uh, the Cleveland Plain Dealer covered a talk I gave at the Cleveland Clinic. And it did a full page spread after this, all about uh, Dr. Roizen's view that chemical sensitivity may not be valid or real, and then my view of how you treat a patient and approach them. I'm from Cleveland. <coughs> uh, this is the Cape Cod Times, and they put my horse in the, you know, I think it helps to have something interesting to look at. So my horse Noodle is still alive and well. Um, I've been getting media attention. Well, basically, I try to seek it out and try to do what I can to change policy through getting other people to help me. 
Um, I was featured on Nightline with Bill Ray, um, and I mentioned that I've uh, been on NIEHS and NIH committees. I pulled all of us together in Washington, and I paid for people to fly there and meet with the head of NIEHS, who's Linda Birnbaum. You guys probably know Linda Birnbaum's name. Right. Linda's been very nice to me, very supportive, actually speaks to me on the phone, and I had a meeting. This is amazing what you can do as one person. I had a meeting with her in, in Bethesda, and I said, could I bring the president of the AMA if I could get him to come? She said, sure, bring anybody you want. So I invited, you know, 20 people, and I got heads of NIH funding, heads of this. I flew in Bill Ray, got some other doctors, and then after we had this meeting, which was basically my meeting, couldn't believe it, we discussed mold was the biggest issue we wanted to discuss, and then the other chemicals and their exposures and effects would follow after. And then we went to Congress, and we, you know, traipsed the halls and talked to various, various congressmen. When I was on the CDC's National Conversation of Public Health, these are the three uh, points that I helped to get on the ticket. And then they were approved by a group of 30, and then the leadership council had to approve that and select them. So this is my big accomplishment, not that anybody will ever see it. Um, improve understanding of individual susceptibility to chemical exposures, and specifically, this was a big deal, they had a fight about saying that we need a facility to assess and treat chemically intolerant or exposed people, because there's no place without chemicals unless you build it. So you've got to have porcelain walls, tile floors, you can't have um, things with formaldehyde in them, furniture that, that will outgas, and these patients won't be able to be studied because they'll be reacting to chemicals in the room. I identify gene-environment interaction, so we have a whole spiel that we wrote about that, and evalu evaluate the potential health impacts of indoor air quality, and they specifically mentioned mold and mycotoxins, and I was relating it to autism, because it's going to be a big factor in autism, specifically during fetal and child development. So they softened what I originally wrote, but they actually have a mold recommendation. And this was recommendations of research that needs to happen, government funding from CDC isn't going in this direction, and those recommendations will help them do it. So it's a big area to tackle. I'm going to touch on the history of environmental medicine, give you some symptoms that you may have or recognize in somebody else. Here's some of the data, and I'm just going to give you a few articles because we're not going to go into everything today. You'll hear my story. You'll see the profound health effects of mold on the nervous system, immune system, and mind, and appreciate that many illnesses that are autoimmune or neurologic or psychiatric have these components and you can't just address one component or you won't get the patient well. It's not so much about research, you're clinicians. You want to fix one person. When you get sick or your mother's sick, you want to cure them. You don't really care about theory. So this field is about how you fix the individual. So conditions that lend themselves to this approach easily are chronic fatigue and fibro, Gulf War syndrome and chemical sensitivity and a similar group, these are all related because Dr. Baraniak proved it. And he said, I'm just going to go, let's see, forward one. Dr. Baraniak looked at spinal fluid of these four groups, and, he, and they, a lot of them were chemically sensitive. They shared 20 proteins that never occur in normal people. The results couldn't be by chance. The um, statistics were very impressive, one in 10 to the 15th. So we discovered new proteins. They highly predicted if you had CSF, oops, sorry, let's see this one, if you had CFS or not. These are some of the names of the proteins. 62 proteins were new, but he said an identical set of proteins found <coughs> indicated that they shared a pathologic mechanisms, a mechanism, meaning these diseases were related. So whether you're in the Gulf War and it's petroleum products, or it was vaccines, or it was mestinon, or whatever it was, it's similar to the person who gets chronic fatigue from a moldy basement. <clears throat> the other diseases, some of them I mentioned, but autism, MS, Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's, peripheral neuropathies are highly um, related to mold exposure. POTS, does anybody know what POTS is? So we're going to get into this in detail if we have time. Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. When you're standing up, your heart rate's too fast. You lay down, it goes to normal. You don't really drop your blood pressure. You just get tachycardic. 
It's very interesting, and you're going to see it in a billion patients in the future. Thin women who pretzel their legs like this have POTS when they sit down. And other people, they lean. They can't maintain blood pressure when they separate their legs and stand like this. And it's very common in environmental exposure. So it's not necessarily always a disease on its own. It's a symptom of being environmentally sick. Um, bipolar disorder, it's pretty fascinating. If you read a textbook on the environmental patient from, let's say, the 60s and 70s and 80s, the top of the pyramid of the untreated environmental patient is bipolar. So not everybody becomes bipolar. Some will have a little OCD. depends on their genetics. But if you don't treat women especially, or men, they will become bipolar in their 40s and 50s. So why do people just become bipolar out of the blue? Part of it's genetic and part of it's exposure. This is very new stuff. I bet you haven't heard this before. Um, patients become very stimulated when they're exposed to chemicals. So once you're sensitive to a chemical, somebody comes by and it smells like perfume, you start talking really fast. You get jazzed wound up. So when you meet a patient that's all jazzed and wound up, you're going to think Lisa's talk. Um, we have no explanation for the development of many neuropsychiatric disorders. Those that can be cured in this way, when we treat them this way, we basically figured out the etiology. So if you take them out of an environment that's making them sick and mentally ill and they improve, you've kind of figured out that the environment or the exposure was the source of it. But it can take years to improve somebody. You see why this is controversial? Autoimmune conditions often have environmental triggers via molecular mimicry. Do you know about molecular mimicry already? Okay, probably more than I do. But gluten, mercury, and mold are the biggest triggers. There's some really good lectures on gluten and mercury uh, that I've attended. Okay, so sort of a boring slide. This is the definition of chemical sensitivity or environmental illness. They're kind of the same thing. You could use either word. Whatever group you're with, chemical sensitivity is a buzzword. It gets you in trouble. MCS is not used by doctors anymore. The patients like multiple chemical sensitivity. It's bad. It loses in the courts. It's not a real condition. And so I've never said multiple. It's a multi-system disorder, usually with many different symptoms, caused by, caused by adverse reactions to environmental incitants at present in air, food, water, and habitats. It can be modified by adaptation and individual susceptibility. It's often caused by significant exposure to mold or chemicals, then causing intolerance to small amounts of all chemicals. You can't tolerate anything. It's not a psychiatric condition, but can have manifestations which cause cognitive and behavioral symptoms. Are you guys with me? Yes? Um, would you include like viral and bacterial exposure in this as well? Yeah, you could. Yeah, so somebody has Lyme and starts, you know, a lot of the Lyme patients have similar stuff. But you find that nobody has one problem. When you start teasing apart a patient who's sick, they'll usually have mold exposure, then they got Lyme, their adrenals are weak, they've got hypothyroidism, their nutrition's not good. So you're looking to fix all the pieces of the puzzle. And who's to say how much of a role that virus played or that bacteria played? It's hard to tell because you're treating so many things at the same time. People don't want to do five years or 10 years of treatment. They kind of want to get going right away. So if you just treat for one infection, you, you may see resolution, but usually you're treating many things. So how does somebody become chemically sensitive? It has to do with this theory of the total load of exposures which overwhelm the body. Very often, mold in the walls of the basement or exposure to pesticides would be the second most common thing or a chemical coming from a new printer in a small office or new carpeting. These are examples. It could be new kitchen cabinets. I know a person who's called me for help because I help people for free for seven years. People call me from all over the country. They got sick. They found me on the internet. And I would help them figure out how to find a doctor and that kind of thing. People would just order kitchen cabinets and they become completely ill, permanently disabled. The liver can't detoxify all of these toxins and you develop intolerance to the others. It's not just the liver. A lot of it has to do with mechanisms we don't understand kindling in the brain, and a lot of it's going to end up being electrical and related to energy, which I'm not a specialist in that. Damage of the autonomic nervous system, you know, which runs on electricity. So when people get exposed, they get disorders related to the function of the autonomic nervous system. So why is the controversy in existence anyway? Is EI even real? 
So as doctors, we assume if we didn't learn it in med school, then it can't be true. So you learned it, it is true. <laughs> we are all skeptics. We see patients that are hypochondriacal. These are the patients. In fact, Sherry Rogers wrote a book and it says, there's no such thing, it's the first sentence of the book, there's no such thing as a hypochondriacal patient, just environmentally sick people that doctors can't figure out what's wrong with them. So the hypochondriacal patient is usually environmentally ill, you know, in loose terms. I'm sure there's somebody who's a hypochondriacal patient. Uh, we all know patients that act wacky and turn us off with too many problems we can't fix. So why should you believe me? The scientific literature is extensive. Regular practitioners don't even look at the literature. I give numerous slides in my Cleveland Clinic talk, and you can refer to that. I'll leave a copy of it here. I'm a reasonable messenger. I look fairly normal now. I don't really have any other ulterior motive. Um, and it's not implausible. This is a tangent. I'm going to show you an article related to this. But the financial interest in medicine, like insurance and pharmaceutical industry, may not want to promote this field. And they've helped to keep a lid on it. So I used to think people who talked about big pharma were paranoid and crazy. But actually, there's a problem. Pharmaceutical companies are not happy about women who are mentally well, right? Because they make a lot of money on psych drugs. So if we go out and we fix all the people in the country, men, women, children, and they don't need ADD meds and antidepressants because they're tuned up and feel much better, then they would have a dramatic loss in profit. So when you talk to somebody in Big Pharma, they totally know about environmental medicine. It's not like it's unheard of to them. They do not want to help us get into the literature. Um, you have to be your own judge and not believe a pharmaceutical rep because it's easier than thinking about a more benign way to manage your patient. Who is more altruistic, environmental docs or pharmaceutical companies? This is a quick article that came out a couple days ago from a British cardiologist. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it basically has to do with ghost writing and saying that there is a sort of a fraud that physicians are paid to write articles about products when they're dishonest. And it, in, in the UK, actually, one of the physicians had died. And posthumously, they were debating whether she'd take his name off of an article. So people will promote things, even if they make $5, let alone $5 million. So you have to be very careful about what's happened at Harvard in psych psychiatric drug uh, promotion. People don't mean to do bad things. They think a particular drug is very useful for a particular disease, and they get out there and promote it. But when they're paid, I think that the, um, the relationship between payment for lectures about treatments should be removed from med school education. And just so you know, the AMA president and I spoke in Washington at a meeting about three years ago. And she stood up, and it was a, a group on women's health research. And I gave a five-minute explanation of, of women's health, as I see it, and what we need to be re doing research on. And the president of the AMA said, watch out for big pharma. That was her message to the group. So this is not me giving a message. It's people understanding now that we've got a problem. I don't want to say capitalism, but money drives everything. I'm working now. I do see myself leaning towards a particular test because it's less expensive for the patient. I don't have to pay for it. When I have to pay for a test for the patient, I tend to do it less. That's like an easy example, right? Because I don't want to pay for everything. OK, the history of environmental medicine. There's Wrinkle, Randolph, and Ray. Wrinkle was a long time ago. He confirmed observations about hidden food allergy and the relationship to eczema and headaches. So he sort of discovered things initially. He was an allergist. Once IgE allergy was discovered, they split. The allergy methods that they designed in environmental medicine were controversial and weren't based on IgE. These patients didn't have elevated IgE most of the time. They had IgG food reactions and other mechanisms which we don't now understand. So traditional allergies split maybe in the 60s or 70s. And now they're referring patients back to environmental physicians when they can't handle them. But so that's why the field had a problem. They couldn't get along with the existing fields. Um, Dr. Randolph is the father of environmental medicine. And he studied Wrinkle's work. And then he incorporates his understanding of, of, from Hans Selye about adaptation, addiction, and tolerance to food, alcohol, and chemicals. This is a very good book. I have all my patients read it. It's called The Alternative Approach to Allergies by Dr. Randolph. 
think it was written in the 70s, and it's about food allergy and mental health. It's really very interesting to watch his understanding of why people have mental reactions to foods that they're sensitive to. Dr. Randolph treated Dr. Ray, who's a cardiovascular surgeon who's still alive in Dallas, and then Bill Ray treated me. He has the best allergy testing in the world, and the Environmental Health Center of Dallas is available for students and doctors all over the world go and study with him. So this is a sketch of what the total load looks like. So it includes infectious agents, mold, and everything else you can think of. One of the interesting facts is that 5% of the population is disabled from chemical sensitivity, 15% have symptoms of being a little chemically sensitive, and 40% have at least mild symptoms but have no idea. So we have 74 million people affected, but then how does everybody deny it? We have, we have acceptance from the government that you can be disabled and get disability for this condition, but the AMA says it's not a real condition. It doesn't make any sense. This is my frustration, because I got it, and then I was like, oh my god, what? nobody knows. OK, this is just more facts. 15% of college students are sensitive, but as you get older, oh, sorry. <coughs> As you get older, it doubles in the elderly. So in Gulf War, War veterans that were deployed have doubled the rate of those that stayed stateside. So they got exposed to something over there that doubled the rate of chemical sensitivity. Yet doctors are taught nothing about this problem. So what are the biomarkers of chemical sensitivity? I'm not really getting into it. I just I listed some at the bottom. But here is a study that was done on uh, 135 patients. Three quarters were female. They were having disabling sensitivity to small concentrations of chemicals, like perfume or diesel exhaust. We suggest, this is the finding of the author, that appropriate tests of the central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, nose and sinuses, pulmonary function, T cell subsets, chemical antibodies, and autoimmunity be performed. If four of the seven show abnormality, then a diagnosis of chemical sensitivity is supported. The other things that are biomarkers I'm just going to go into very briefly. Venous blood gas testing, we look for elevated oxygen. I can explain it later. Next talk. Uh, lowered glutathione levels, catalase levels, T cells, fibrinogen goes up, you get inflamed and your fibrinogen increases, your blood gets thick. CRP goes up from inflammation. Vasointestinal peptide and VEGF are markers for mold exposure. And heart rate variability is a marker for um, the heart having a, a better more regular RR interval, which is worse. You want to have variability of your RR interval. So pollution makes heart rate variability worse. And that's been published out of Harvard and many, many places now. OK, spec scanning can be done. My husband had the worst spec scan they've ever done. Just toast. The brain was, it was not homogeneous in its perfusion. Okay. There's a mouse model of chemical sensitivity. I'm not going to go into detail, but they sensitized a mouse to a chemical. Specifically, this chemical was the one that was useful. And not only did they get IgE to go up, but they got other markers to change. And the mouse was then sensitized to other related chemicals at low levels. They took a mouse, they exposed it to something, and they made it a chemically sensitive mouse. And this is out of um, Japan. This is just a quick study in Japan. 84% of patients, three quarters are women. Usually the men are exposed at work. The women were more severe than the men. How does a patient present? They have common everyday symptoms. You're going to see it in a lot of people. They don't like detergents, perfumes, walking down the detergent aisle. They may notice, so these are kind of important, fatigue. Morning headaches, especially with mold. They wake up in a moldy house, they're going to have a headache. Muscle weakness. They can be very depressed with mold. And I'm not going to show the article, but there's a 40% depression rate if you have mold in the home, growing in the home. And that was published out of Brown University. Inability to read and remember things. Anxiety. Can't stand for a while. You become anxious, dizzy on standing. Weird skin rashes. Reactions to lotions and foods and medicines. 
If you get sleepy to Sudafed and, and jazzed up from Benadryl, that's probably somebody who's sensitive to medication. I was not sensitive to medication, but a lot of the patients will come in and say, I can't take any antibiotics. Oh, somebody's nodding their head. <laughs> Um, inhalation anesthetics will often make people have a very prolonged response. They won't wake up very quickly, and they can be out of it for weeks to months. And anesthesia alone, especially a long surgery, can make you chemically sensitive and damage you. <coughs> or if they're already somewhat chemically sensitive, they have anesthesia. So you, you'll find, for those of you going into anesthesia, that you have to use different, maybe propofol, versed, local, spinal, because they can't have gas. Patients will be sensitive to cats, down feathers. I mentioned the detergent aisle at the grocery store. They, they can't walk down it. They pinch their nose. They feel uncomfortable there. They have increased sense of smell. They have an emotionally kind of a freak out response when they smell chemicals, as if it was 10,000 times stronger. They can smell fabric softener in the air outside of homes and can't bear it. I ride my horse on trail rides, and I used to have to wear a mask because I could smell all the laundry products as I went for a couple of miles. They can't handle fireplace smoke, and cigarette smoke really bothers them. So some of these people have to remain indoors all winter because of fireplace smoke. The clothing tags itch the back of the neck and have to be cut out. So how many people have relatives that do that, if not yourself? This gets me, apparently I got patients flying across the country because I said this at a line meeting. The bra becomes too constricting. You can't wear a bra. And I think it's because of ischemic tissue. You can't roll up your sleeves. This is when you're fairly severe. You can't roll your sleeves up because it's so painful because there's not enough oxygen in the tissue and you cut it off with the tight, the tight clothing. This has been published. Blood pressure cuff blowing up is leading to pain in fibromyalgia patients. So this is a published article. This is not me just giving anecdotes. Sore throat in the morning because of VOCs in the bedroom. I got it from the um, hotel. I'm in a pure room. Why are there pure rooms? There are pure, pure rooms because of environmental medicine, because there are patients requesting to have rooms at hotels that don't use chemicals in the room. So I requested it. They said, oh, we have a pure room. So I got the pure room. It has an air filter. It has no down pillows. It has um, no formaldehyde in the materials used for the pure room. So the public is ready for this. The hotel industry is ready. The question is, what are the doctors going to do about it? Um, headaches to red wine is usually the first sign of becoming environmentally sensitive. Most women will relate to that soon. Blurry vision, pretzeling of the legs are examples of dysautonomia. When you're driving and you see stars and halos coming off of the headlights and can't drive. A reddened face from vasculitis, like in alcoholics, but it's not always alcohol that leads to this reddened face. They like to sleep with the window open. They panic. They can't fly in airplanes. The jet fuel, the newspaper smells, uh, other people with a concentrated density of, of people on the plane the patients don't know, the people don't know, that they have panic or anxiety related to being chemically sensitive. They just can't fly well. They need to be sedated. Yesterday I flew here from Martha's Vineyard on a Cape Air plane, and then I got on a bigger plane, and I met a guy and I was talking to him. He's a doctor, actually leaving Martha's Vineyard, and somebody introduced us, so we were talking. He's in anesthesia. By the time we got off the plane, he realized that his wife freaks out on planes, gets full-blown hives all the time, and has sensitivity to perfume and diesel exhaust because she's chemically sensitive. And this is why she's also diagnosed as bipolar. It's common. Every time I fly, everybody I talk to has somebody that's affected. And they probably had a mold exposure about 10 years ago. And he's got ADD and he's on Adderall. So is it better to have them medicated or for them to try to get the mold toxins out of them and tune up whatever was damaged by the mold exposure, and then they won't need the drugs and they'll be very functional. My case is classic of other patients. So even if we just get through this slide, you know, I'll have done my work. I was first diagnosed with Addison's disease. I later learned about mitochondrial damage because the treatment of the Addison's didn't fix me completely. I still couldn't raise my arms to wash my hair. I could brush the horse just once, and my arm was dead. I took Cortef and it got better, cortisol, but it didn't fix everything. I got very tired in stores, and I needed a wheelchair in Target, and that was this dysautonomia problem. If I took a Cortef, I could go into Target or Home Depot for half an hour, but then I would fall apart. So cortisol helps, but it's not the treatment for the disease. 
I became more dysautonomic when I was exposed to a chemical. I had no idea that I was chemically sensitive because I wore so much perfume. And I used downy and Tide. And I should have just changed this to any fabric softener and commercial detergent. You can't use your nose to figure out what smells were making me sick. And this principle is called masking. Masking has taken place when they get away from scents or the moldy home. They unmask when they get uh, unused to it. So it takes five days to get away from something to then when you are re-exposed, it'll bother you. I've done this now when I go to Dallas and I watch other patients. I even share an apartment with another patient. They don't want to be in a tiled room. They don't want to be in a stark bedroom, oasis bedroom with no materials, no polyester. And then by the end of five days, they cook lamb chops. They can't handle the smoke. They go outside. They don't like exhaust. Then they love their room. Now they love their oasis bedroom because they can't tolerate everything else. It happens to almost every patient. So if you're in practice and you say, well, I think you should get out of your moldy home and get rid of your moldy clothes, you've got to tell them. You may become sensitive on the fifth day or fourth day. You're going to need a charcoal mask. I'm here for you. We have a plan. Because what's, it's horrible to become exquisitely sensitive to chemicals and to not know what you're going through, which is what happened to me. You, you're basically running away from everything. And I was in Los Angeles, which is very polluted. OK, this is a form of adaptation. Hans Selye goes into great detail about it. It's very important to understand this phenomenon. Smoking is a good example. When you start smoking, you cough. Later, you like it. You adapt. You don't cough. But you're on your way to chronic illness. You can't stop easily because you're addicted. If you stop and you go into withdrawal for a while, and then you crave it. Then the withdrawal symptoms go away. You hate it if you're re-exposed and somebody else comes by and smokes cigarettes. It's a great example. Sometimes it smells good when somebody lights up a cigarette from far away, but rarely. So this is the effect of the total load on adaptation. It has to do with a steady state. You get exposed to something. It bothers you a lot. You go to the office. Let's say it's uh, carpeting in the office. You get exposed over and over and over again every day, and eventually your steady state increases to the, your different level. So you have this immune response. You use up your nutritional supply. Your metabolism may get jazzed up. Then, if you go on vacation, you go to Mexico, and you got clean air. You decrease your total load. You de-adapt. You come back to the office, and you have this huge response and get a massive headache the first day you walk in. But then you get used to it. So mold is the most controversial and prevalent issue affecting the environmentally ill that we physicians have decided to focus on. The Environmental Health Center of Dallas says that 60% of people come there for mold exposure, usually from water intrusion in the house. People won't know it's their issue unless you ask them, do you have a musty basement? Did you move to a new job before you came ill? Are the ceiling tiles damp? Do you, are there marks on the ceiling? There's usually mold on the drywall behind or above or somewhere. Does your child's school have a problem? Do others have headaches, fatigue, anxiety? Do you feel better on the weekends when you're home and away from the job? typo there. Um, can you tell when you walk in? Can your eyes locate? And it's weird. You can, by osmolar gradient, you can tell if it's coming from up there or coming from down here. So people will follow their nose. They walk in and they go, and they start following and they can kind of locate it. So if you say, well, what seems to bother you? Sometimes they'll be able to figure out it's something under the sink and they'll find mold under the sink. Or it's just strange how people can follow the concentration gradient in the room, because I guess the nose is pretty useful. There are three toxins you can measure in the urine. We're just cutting to the chase, because I'm not going to be able to tell you everything I know about mold. Um, trichocythines, ochratoxin, and aflatoxin. They're measured at real-time labs. It's uh, not covered by insurance. Some patients will have all three. This person has all three. They, they are usually very sick. Uh, these are very high numbers. A 15 for ochratoxin, two is a limit of detection, or you know, two is positive. Trichocythines are very common in these patients, more common than I have here. The trichocythines are an agent of bioterrorism. It's called yellow rain. It was used in Vietnam and Afghanistan. The Army Blue Book writes all about trichocythines. It's not my imagination. 
probably have something. Okay, so here's a, 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 a specimen. I haven't done this, but this is, a, I think, gas chromatography. And these are present, 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 present. These are all the toxins in one home. One sample of dust had, you know, almost a dozen mycotoxins in it. These toxins, Riordan and uh, a couple other ones, are satrotoxin. These are trichocythines. It's a group. So the trichocythine test will actually pick up about a dozen of a variety of trichocythines. And this is how I treat a patient. If I think that they're mold exposed, I need some data to prove, are their clothes toxic? Are they going to have to leave everything they own because they have a bioterrorism agent in their stuff? It's horrifying. So it's devastating to leave your home. The clothes will often smell moldy when you examine the patient. So I do a sniff and I write it on my physical. And the clothes can smell moldy, sweet, or pungent. They can't be salvaged. And the Army Blue Book writes about this. There is no way to clean clothing once contaminated. So people try to wash it or dry clean it. It's not possible. They will contaminate anybody's dryer they put it in. So they, sh they shouldn't really go to relative's house with these clothes and cross-contaminate. It's a principle in toxicology with other chemicals and pesticides as well. You can test dust off of clothing and the home at a, a company called Pure Air Controls. You can va vacuum a little dust, and if you prove the clothing is toxic, or the, the couch is toxic, then it's a couple hundred thousand dollars when you throw away your life. Once you're in your 40s, you've got stuff. It's not a small thing. You lose everything. Okay. So away from that subject for a second. Adrenal insufficiency is very common in mold-exposed patients. Dysautonomia is very common. These two things should be treated at the beginning. The patient feels better. Then you can work on supplements that help the mitochondria and deal with the chemical sensitivity. So this is my view of chemical sensitivity. Bill Ray works on this first, but the patients have this, so they can't get in and do sauna because they, they're too adrenally insufficient and weak. They can't walk to the clinic, and they have dysautonomia. They can't stand up, and the heat in the sauna will make them more dysautonomic, so they can't tolerate treatment. This is my favorite article, so I made it to this point. Thurman, in 1988, for the Army, did a study on rats. Breathing trichocythines, aerosolized trichocythines. People say you have to eat it. There's no study on air. This is an air study in animals. They got adrenal necrosis. They died, but only the female rats died. The effect was completely prevented if you gave the female rats testosterone. And I gave you a copy of the Thurman article, you know, the abstract. This demonstrates in animals what we observe in humans, that females, like a lot of females have chronic fatigue and low adrenal function. They get fatigue, allergy, depression after mold exposure. They're not believed by the husband. And the husband usually develops belligerence and intolerable behavior, and they are often divorced. And this is just what I see from the 2,000 people that I've helped. So I wrote an article on mold and marital discord and why people split up. Because the man with testosterone doesn't become chemically sensitive at the same rate that the woman does. I don't know why. That's your job to, you know, please do some research and explain. And so the man says, I don't care about Clorox. And she's screaming, don't use the Lysol, don't use the Clorox. They can't get along. He's putting on cologne, using regular toothpaste, and she's freaking out for the smell of the toothpaste. They don't last very long. So he usually will stay in the home and go down with a ship. The woman will protect the children and take them and leave and flee to survive. And they do not stay married. This is a saliva test, which is really well loved in integrative medicine. Everybody loves doing saliva testing for adrenal function. There's a lot in the literature about its utility in research. It's very useful. We use it clinically every day. The cortisol should be high in the morning and then go down to almost zero by midnight. This is a normal person, high normal, you know, healthy cortisol response. Cortisol is high to get you up and get you going for your day. This is a typical, this is probably me. I was like this for eight years, flatline. You could test me any day of the week, I was always the same. Can't get up, can't get out of bed, tired, want to sleep till noon, you know. Um, if you give me Cortef, before I want to get out of bed, I can get out of bed. So now, my graph is improved, so I'm up here. So I'm not really great, 
so I could take less Cortef. But this is a good physical demonstrative. You know, if you have a depressed person, you have an obligation to find out if they have adrenal insufficiency. The other ways for figuring that out are ACTH stimulation testing. So I do it in every patient. I do mini dose. Everybody deserves to go to an endocrinologist and do it. But the higher dose of ACTH will make everybody look normal. So a lot of endocrinologists said, if you want to bring out a subtle case of adrenal insufficiency, you should give a, a small dose of one unit. This is just a, oh, sorry. This is an interesting example. My dog, who's a male, was in the toxic house with us. And I, I probably didn't mention, but my husband and my dog have Addison's. We all have Addison's disease from this exposure. It's pretty obvious we had an environmental exposure, but I didn't find that out because the men got it later. The males got it later. Cortisol in the dog, look down here first. Early 2003, the cortisol was five and goes to 14 with stimulation. It should double, or in humans, it should go above 20. So this is normal in a dog, let's say. Here's the dog in 2004. A year later, it's 0.2 to 0.8. Why is it so low? Because the dog now has Addison's disease. The dog was crying every evening with shortness of breath. Tried to walk across the floor, was exhausted. Give him a Cortef, he felt great. Pretty easy to diagnose. So I'm like really good at animals now. So this is a house and all the places, oh, sorry, I'm so spastic. This is a house and all the sources of, you know, garage, fireplace, cooking range. Cooking is a big problem. Gas ranges are not for chemically sensitive people. They switch to electric. Porcelain trailer, a lot of people want a place to live when they become chemically sensitive and we dream of a place like this, which is pretty pathetic, that this is what we want to survive. This is an example of an air freshener, or I guess it's labeled green. But anyway, these are the chemicals, a friend of mine did research at University of Washington on what's in air fresheners, detergents, and fabric softeners. And now she published a new article on polluting the air from fabric softener, how bad it is that we're polluting the air. She's obviously chemically sensitive and she's done great work, but not everybody wants to get out there and say that they had the condition. They just do the research and keep quiet. I'm a little of the reverse of that. This is a med student who got a vasculitis from anatomy lab. A lot of us have problems with anatomy because that, that smell, we smelled like fat and formalin for years, or at least one year. Um, this is a patient who became exquisitely sensitive to formaldehyde in stores, in clothing in stores. It's called sizing. It makes the, the clothing stiff. So he got sensitized, sensitized in anatomy lab, but then he couldn't handle formaldehyde anywhere. So he avoided it, and he was okay. And then on re-exposure, they get sick again. Now, this is my story. I didn't know I was chemically sensitive in anatomy lab. I would have dysautonomia when I was standing up with all the bodies open. I was good if I went at six in the morning to do my own body by myself. I didn't know why, I just felt better. But I couldn't stand up, I was always sitting on a chair. I got nauseated when I did fetal pig dissection in ninth grade, I had to do mine outside. So I got sick when I was 30 or 40 or whatever, and oh my God, I'm 50 now. So I got sick when I was older, but now I look back, as many chemically sensitive people do, and they find out what really happened to me? When did it happen? When did this start? Because nobody else was sick from fetal pig dissection but me. And I probably had a, grew up in a, an apartment in Cleveland that had a little bit of mold exposure. And uh, my, I always had a bloody nose. My bloody nose is a lot and that's a sign of mold exposure. So if you go back and look, you may figure out which was the moldy place or which was the chemical exposure. Where did you first start developing symptoms, even though you may not fall off the wagon or fall or whatever, get really sick until much later in life. I thought this was an interesting article. that NIEHS said that there's an increase in diabetes with, um, I think it's prenatal exposure, the mother's exposure to pesticide application. So pollution makes you fat. Children exposed in the womb are twice as likely to be overweight. I guess it refutes the idea of personal responsibility. A friend of mine did a study on pesticides. His name is Bill Meggs. He studied pesticide exposure, and his lab assistant said, hey, it's been a month, and the rats are fat that had pesticide exposure. The other ones aren't. So then they did a study. They completed it. They published. 
that the rats exposed to the pesticides gain more weight than the regular rats on the same feed. Would you say I should finish? Yeah. Okay. So that they can have okay. I'm going to summarize with treatment, and then we'll finish here. And then the rest of the slides are available. I have history, physical review of symptoms, you know, systems, uh, if you want to look at it. So treatment is based on getting away from the source of the problem. If it's mold, you've got to leave, get fresh clothing, pre-wash it to remove the chemicals that are in all new clothes because this, the patients won't do well with them. They wash them in borax and seventh generation. Stay at a friend's house or a hotel. Advise them to read the appropriate books. And I mentioned Edelson uh, called Living with Environmental Illness. <laughs> Prepare to become more sensitive to things. Decrease your total load. No chemicals in air, food, and water. Glass bottled water, Mountain Valley provides it nationally. Charcoal air filter in the bedroom. Stop working if there's a chemical problem at work. Create an oasis bedroom where you can heal. Um, no down, only cotton, no books, newspapers, rubber shoes, that's supposed to be shoes, in the bedroom. Organic food, if possible. Avoid exposure to all of the things I just mentioned. You cannot go shopping in stores. Malls make you tired. They'll make you very sick when you start to do this unmasking process. Treat low adrenal and thyroid function. Diagnose and treat dysautonomia. And I have a, a spiel that I gave you on use of fluorinef and minadrine and how you treat uh, dysautonomia with medication. And then after a couple of years, they may not need medication any longer. They'll get better. Oxygen, if indicated, you do a venous blood gas and determine if they need O2. O2 is two hours a day for 18 days. Then you repeat a venous blood gas and see if the tissue hypoxia and endothelial damage has improved and then they can have oxygen intermittently if they need it at home. My patients do very well with IV nutrient therapy. I start it for two to six weeks and I fix all the hormones and I give them oral supplements. IV vitamin C, CoQ10, vitamin B, magnesium, carnitine, taurine saved me. I was sick, I was weak, I couldn't get my feet up the steps. I did a couple of IVs in Dallas and I got better faster than everybody else because I spent money on something that was expensive and I try to do that more affordably and make it like $100 each, not $450 each. And that way people can maybe spend $1,000 and get this boost, then you start to detoxify and put them in the sauna. 10 minutes, very low temperature, maybe infrared. I like traditional sauna made of poplar, not out of cedar. If they crash, meaning they're tired for days, they have worsening symptoms, they can't keep doing sauna. They're gonna get really sick. So you just say, do a 10 minute sauna, tell me how it goes, we'll come back and reevaluate in a week or two. You can add cholestyramine if they're a mold patient, four grams, four times a day. Uh, this is practical information for doctors who are treating. And it binds mold toxins, and there's a doctor who discovered this, and it's also a binder of cholesterol. So it's a traditional drug that you can use. I'm not gonna get into it today, but the rotational diet, you only repeat foods every four days. If you eat the same food every day, they, did, they get sensitive to it. Then that brings down the whole system and they don't feel well. You want them to do as well as possible, so they put them on a rotational diet where you have pork on Monday, hamburger on Tuesday, lamb chops, on Monday, and then rare foods. If you can't find any foods you're not sensitive to that make you sick, you go to ostrich, you go to buffalo. And people eat foods they've never had, like rutabaga or whatever a rutabaga is, so that they don't have sensitive uh, allergic type reactions or feel sick from their foods. Provocation and neutralization allergy testing, it's, I'm going to set it up, but it's really hard to practice because this means you've got to be an allergist. And you do testing for all the molds, chemicals, pollens, foods on the skin. Each test takes about 30 to 60 minutes. It takes weeks to do all the testing. And then you go home with your shots, and you do your allergy shots once every four days, and you are not sensitive to the world. It neutralizes your reaction. We don't know how it works. It's unbelievably helpful. And the last thing is autogenous lymphocyte antigen called ALF. It's only available in Dallas, which I have no financial relationship with Dallas, and this saved me. It's your white cells. They culture them for a few weeks. They give you, with your allergy shot, you do a little injection of the white cells. It boosts the T cell function somehow, which I'm not a microbiologist, and it really helped me. When I wanted to save money and I thought I was well about six years ago, I went off of all of this. Within two months, the whole disease came back. 
I couldn't go outside because of fireplace smoke. I was very sensitive to everything. I called Bill Ray on the phone, and he said, are you on your shots? Are you on ALF? And I go, no, I, I was well. And so he said, get your stuff. So I reordered ALF. I did one shot, and I was much better. And I've never gone off. So yes, I have to do allergy shots you know, once a week now. But I am no longer sensitive to chemicals. I am more normal, although I spoke quickly today, more normal than I think a lot of other middle-aged housewives who are scattered and all over the place. I can practice medicine again. I've started a business. I give lectures all over the country. And I am very frustrated with uh, the system that has basically said women are hysterical who have these conditions because men and children obviously get this. And so I think we need men in medicine, men in administration, to take the ball and say, hey, what are we going to do to promote this field and make it part of men's school education now? So I thanks, thank you very much for your time. Just a real quick question yeah. before I open it up. <clears throat> How many of these treatments are covered by insurance? Well, um, I think the allergy testing for inhalants mm -hmm. is covered. So for po I haven't tried to do it myself, but for pollens and molds, it's covered. Right, but what about treatment? I'm actually getting coverage now. I didn't know initially that IV vitamins would be paid for, but Blue Cross pays for IV vitamins and so does um, United Healthcare. And um, I'm asking some of the Medicaid, types of Medicaid that we have in Massachusetts to cover, and I think they may cover as well. So an injection of glutathione, it sounds like, you know, we give it in ICU when you're having somebody on TPN. They get, they get not maybe glutathione, but they get vitamin B and they get you know, zinc and selenium, which is what I'm putting in an IV. Um, all I know is it really works. It's the, my best advice is to tell people when you're really sick, what are you going to do? Are you going to draw it out and say, I don't have any money? Or are you going to have a fund that, that people who got well pay into to help people who aren't well? So my feeling is that a lot of the women who got sick were very wealthy. And they should pay for the ones that come after. And everybody would help each other. Because it's really bad if you have no uh, place to live. You're allergic to all homes. You're living in the car. They park in my driveway on the vineyard. They, they get there and they, they don't have anywhere to go because they can't stay in the hotel. Um, it's 20 degrees and they're staying in the car. It's really bizarre. And then they, um, you know, they walk around. They may not even know they're supposed to have a mask because nobody educated them. So they're just avoiding smells everywhere. And then I say, well, why don't we try doing an IV? And then by the end of a week, they're able to function better, potentially start sauna and I'm getting them at least, it, it'll be a few years for them to heal. But at least they have a, a concrete approach to getting well. And it isn't completely for the rich. So I'm treating you know, Medicaid patients and Medicare patients. And the workup I gave, um, you know, I know it's a lot of paperwork that I gave, but one of the lists is the lab tests that I do. Um, and I do a lot of them. At, I, don't, I don't consider it a screening test. I'm really looking for all these things, venous blood gas. And I do a standing aldosterone on every patient. So I know if they need floor enough. I do an ACTH, to, you know, on every, I'm not going to guess. If you're obese, you don't have adrenal insufficiency because it's not always the case. Some people don't look like the hormone deficiency they have. And then if I don't treat them, there would be years for them to improve. So now um, I think it's possible to get treated with, I'm taking insurance and people are doing okay, you know, covering. Any other questions? What, what is the sauna, um, some, of it, some of the toxins come out of the sweat. So they've measured the sweat. They can prove that if you did a hallucinogenic drug 30 years ago, it'll come out when you do sauna. I don't know anything about hallucinogenic drugs. I just know this fact. Uh, because L. Ron Hubbard in the Scientology group was into sauna way before, I think, the environmental doctors. But sauna, in my mind, brings the toxins out of the fat, and not just superficial, but also retroperitoneal fat, and body fat. And then the liver will reprocess re it, and it'll go into the stool or the urine. So usually it's stool because it's going to be fat soluble. So if you do too long of a sauna, you'll bring out so much in terms of toxicity. The first sauna I did, I went to the, and I don't understand any of it. I was in Dallas. I didn't understand any principles. I, I went there in perfume. You know, it was really stupid. And I went and did my first sauna in the first couple of days, and the urine was thick. So something came out in the urine. Some of the fats came out and um, looked opaque. The urine was opaque. And then I crashed. I got very dysautonomic, and I was hospitalized for a month. You know, so it was a very bad experience. And um, my philosophy stems from my bad experience of getting too sick. So I want to be slow to treat the patient carefully 
So they don't have this period where they get so sick they are stuck, let's say stuck in Dallas for six months. Because a lot of these patients can't leave. They can't leave the housing. There's nowhere to go. And there are millions of them, tens of millions of people in the country who have nowhere to live. And there's no housing for them. There's no group at NIH that believes. You know, there are individuals that are supportive, but it's a massive public health problem. And people think, oh, it doesn't affect me or you. But like, if you were wearing perfume, or Bet picked me up today, and she's probably got symptoms of this. Everybody's got symptoms of uh, chemical intolerance over the age of 40, if you ask them. And if they wear perfume, they don't know. And what's interesting is the older woman, who's very, you know, 65 or 85 years old, let's say, wacky and full of perfume and reeks, they're usually very environmentally ill. And if you take away their perfume, they won't, they won't give it up. They don't want to give up their perfume. They're addicted to it. And their personality and whatever is, is my mother won't stop wearing perfume because she's so wrapped up in it. And, and she's very dysautonomic. I checked her heart rate. It's like 110 standing. So I hired a, a, a girl to work in my office. She's a college student. She's going to medical school next year. And she finally said, I've been working for you for a month, but I think I have all these symptoms. My heart rate's 150. She had full-blown dysautonomia. I did a, you know, a um, tilt table on her, and they thought she had VTAC. Her sister, also sick. I treated both of them. They're both at college, living together, drinking glass bottled water. Her career is completely changed. Now she's going to go into environmental medicine. And, and whatever branch of medicine she chooses, you can't unlearn what you've, what you've understood if you've gotten some of the point of this today. So it's fun going into traditional medicine. Yes, surgery is useful. Yes, emergency medicine is useful. But we shouldn't be wearing a perfume in the emergency room. And I was doing all these wrong things because it wasn't appropriate for the patient. So I've learned you know, a whole different way of approaching chronic illness. And for those of you going into psychiatry, this is really very pertinent. So I encourage you to either contact me or go study with Bill or come to a meeting, because you can't be a regular psychiatrist once you know this. You'll feel guilty taking people's money. Anyway, thanks very much for having me. Yeah. So I actually have uh, uh -oh. a couple of things. Um, so um, part of your treatment paradigm for people with uh, chemical sensitivity is to make them give up lots of things. Right. Well, they want to. You're just telling them what they right. could do. For them. But I'm getting at the issue of the fact, well, I'm assuming it's probably a fact, and that is issues of environmental justice and health disparities. Because one would imagine that multi homes are going to be in places whereby homes are, are prone to flooding. Often mm -hmm. those people don't have flood insurance. They live in poor social economic communities and therefore actually have the environmental justice issue of repeated flooding. And many of those people actually don't have access to health care right. to do the things that you recommend. And even if they did, they may not have the socioeconomic status to be able to do all of this. Well, here's the deal. If they know that the home is making them sick post-Katrina, and they could pitch a tent outside or go to California, people go to California or somewhere where it's warm in the winter or whatever, or stay, they could pitch a tent and be better than they are in the home. The knowledge of what's making you sick, they deserve to know. What they do with the knowledge, if you can't afford to fix them, but they deserve to know the cause and effect to struggle to survive. It's not fair to hold it that say, oh my God, we can't let it out of the cat out of the bag because all these people will sue and all the school children and the 40% of homes that are moldy in the country, they're going to complain and oh, they're on toxic dump sites. We have huge litigatory problems and practical problems of how to pay for people to be treated, how to educate children in non-toxic schools. It's overwhelmingly complicated. But I was just dealing with trying to explain theory and practice. Well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's... Yeah. It's, it's affecting like the, the pesticide application. I was going to mention, at Cornell, they used to spray the pesticides in the dorm rooms and at Penn undergrad. And now I realize, oh my god, how bad that is. You don't know how bad pesticides are. Once you become chemically sensitive, pesticide will set you back years if I get sprayed, you know, go to a room that's sprayed. And I went into a deli for a cup of coffee five years ago here, smelled pesticide and left because I'm scared to get sick again. So yeah, it affects people in the country with all of these, you know, it's the 9-11 workers, 
It's the Gulf War veterans. It's the people coming back from war now. They need this theory to understand this theory to try to approach helping people. So the, um, the other thing you said that I think is worth um, uh, flushing out also is um, uh, the issue of uh, biomarkers. So um, uh, for those in the group, uh, when Lisa was talking about um, total load, uh, one of the uh, modern terms in all of uh, biomedical science is omics. And there is a group down in California which have an environmental health sciences center like we do here at Penn, our Center of Excellence in Environmental Toxicology, who are very interested in what they call the exposome, which is to try and actually come up with uh, uh, urine and uh, serum tests to look at, if you like, total load. Uh, the other thing, so, so if you think about blood and urine tests to measure total load, then what you're measuring is a biomarker of exposure. exposure. Those exposures can come and go. So I could take a, a sample of your urine and serum at any moment in time and find many, many chemicals in there. Right? One question becomes, because we have more and more sensitive analytical methods to detect small traces of chemicals, whether or not those amounts are cause for concern or they can be not cause for concern. But the bottom line is, is what you're measuring is a point in time and you're measuring total load by measuring a biomarker of exposure. What Lisa also told you was issues of protein measurements that she made in cerebral, well not she made, she described protein me measurements in cerebral spinal fluid. Those, that signature has probably occurred after the exposure, so we call that a biomarker of effect. So the difference between exposure and effect. So simple example is you're exposed to benzene, I want to know whether you've been exposed to benzene, I can go into your blood and serum and measure benzene metabolites, but benzene's cleared, right? Three weeks after the benzene exposure, I can't find benzene in you. But it may have left behind a molecular signature of that exposure. That would be a biomarker of effect. Right? And so uh, we're very interested in environmental health sciences actually to take on the concept that we actually perhaps are not so much interested always in the biomarkers of exposure because they're difficult to actually uh, quantify well because of the longitudinal situation, it can change over time. What we're really interested in is biomarkers of effect that can predict susceptibility to disease, disease onset, and so on, so that we can actually intervene and treat. So, so the, that's the real challenge, is the biomarkers of effect. The problem is that we actually don't have very many reliable biomarkers of effect that we can pin to disease right now. Right? And that's, that's the real challenge in environmental health sciences, one of the real challenges. And there are some published studies on neurologic findings on blink reflex, balance, color discrimination. A lot of neurologic um, markers of effect are known. I brought a book called Mold and Mycotoxins by Kilburn, which I suggest everybody take a look at. One article after another documenting the biomarkers of effect in people who are exposed. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.